Hello, hello, hello. Lots of hellos as the system gets into juice and we start knowing that we're streaming to the world. Hi, I'm James Bradley. I'm one of the Liftoff co-founders at Liftoff Global Network. I have the camera positioned up here today because it's um, not going to be getting in the way of my presentation that I have on this screen and my streaming information and chat room that I have on this screen. Um, today's Today's topic of the workshop that we're going to be talking about will be something that is very, very dear to my heart and something that I know is very dear to many people that work at Liftoff, and that's how to best, how to find the best possible audiences for your projects. Um, audiences are a really, really tricky bunch. They are every, I mean, every single person on this planet is a member of a potential audience. And I think it's always important to recognize that when that when we are creating content, we are creating content for a, for a particular type of people. Um, as an audience member myself, I always look for certain things in projects. I always look for certain things in the content that I consume. And I'm sure you're the same. I'm sure you're exactly the same. You look for certain content that you consume too. So it's really important to kind of understand how we can best position our work to reach those potential audience members. Um, as a film festival, we rely heavily on audience attendance. So anything that our filmmakers can do prior to bringing films to us to generate audience is always a massive plus. We get hundreds of thousands of films a year sent in to us um, from our sessions free to submit to festivals all the way up to our Los Angeles Liftoff premium festivals that we screen actually in physical theatres um, around the world. Los Angeles, Tokyo, London, um, the list goes on and on and on. It's 11 cities now. But the the, the primary thing is that when we, we get a lot of 10 out of 10 content, and if some of that content comes to us with audience-backed data or audience-backed information that we can then use to help sell tickets for that particular type of film, those films are going to stand out an awful lot more than, than the other 10 out of 10s. That's just our nature as a business. And I'm sure, in fact, I'm almost 100% positive that that is the case for most film festivals. So it's quite a good insight to understand that filmmakers that come with, with some idea of audience prior to the actual screenings at festivals, they tend to do a lot better in getting officially selected. So um, without further ado, let's, let's, let's crack straight on. The chat room's looking a little bit quiet at the moment, but I hope that will build up in time um, as we go through our presentation. So this is how to find the best audiences for your film projects presented by me. So here we go. Get my little squirrely whirly thing there that you can see on screen. Hopefully you can all see it okay. And we'll click forward. So yeah, there's simply too much content out there to get through. So right now we are in a, I would say, a an explosion of content. There are so many providers. Um, the screen simply wasn't big enough and we didn't have enough slides to stick on the amount of, of, of people that are currently giving us content from all over the place. And I just, I'm not even just saying like, content that is spread across multiple platforms. This is content that's spread across, well, this is content that's exclusive and exclusive to these individual content um, providers to, to, to the home. Um, the likes of Netflix, obviously, and Prime, uh, Hulu, not so well known in the UK, but very well known in the United States. The new ones, Apple TV Plus and Disney Plus, um, the British BBC iPlayer, HBO Now, which is a little bit more well, well recognized in America than it is in the UK. And the kind of the niche sort of side of things, which we'll get more onto later, which is like Mubi and Vimeo On Demand, where our online festivals tend to sit. Um, it's really important to know that this that this is the product of mass amounts of content. Um, it's it's crazy to think that there are so many different um, avenues, different channels in effect. Um, we talk quite a lot in the liftoff offices and kind of joke that the future of of TV remote controls won't, won't be like numbers anymore. They'll just be they'll just be logos that you press. And some of them have already come out. You can get Hitachi and Sony and Samsung logos, uh, remotes, remote controls that have the Netflix button, the 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 YouTube button, the Hulu button, etc. It's getting that way. And pretty soon we're going to have TVs that will go beyond the smart TV and will basically just be carriers for these specific streaming platforms. Um, think about it. Imagine if Netflix built their own televisions and sold them to the third world. I mean, it would just be it would be crazy if that sort of thing happened. But it's not within it's not within the remit of the corporations. I mean, these these are very, very heavy hitters and they they spend an awful lot of money a year 
creating content for audiences that they think they know. Um, it's important to understand that your content, if it's general, will tend to get lost on these platforms and they won't find their audience. So it really makes sense to kind of bump in there and see what's actually happening. Um, so this is bad news for filmmakers who try to create content for everyone. This definitely is. At our level specifically, the amount of the amount of of of, um, of providers like this, the amount of the providers that there are existing on in this world, that if you're creating content for everyone, you're going to get lost in there. Um, unless you're spending eighty million dollars on a film or eighty million dollars on a web series or a series, and you're spending half that on your marketing. You're not going to get you're not going to get noticed on these platforms unless you've got a very specific niche, and we can go into those niches later when we when we discuss it a little bit further. Um, so yeah, it is good news though, and it's good news for those who understand human behaviour and how their content can be baited to lure those thousands of people that follow certain niches. So it's really important. Yes, documentaries tend to be the most go to um, the most go to indie content that's out there at the moment. We've got people like, um, we've got the Duplass brothers that are creating really good documentary content. We've got obviously Tiger King that came out very recently that's really exploding, um, very niche. Um, you, if you look at the kind of documentary side of stuff, and if you're a documentary filmmaker, now is the time for creating content, definitely. But that also goes in hand if you're creating um, narrative, narrative content as well. So um, dramatic content that isn't documentary. If you can go down the niche aspect, you you will do well, and we'll look at some case studies now of that sort of stuff. Um, I, like I said before at the beginning of this of this presentation, we do get thousands of films submitted to us each year, and it's very rare that we get content that is simply too general. It's not we don't get lots and lots and lots of very generalized content, which is actually the kind of saving grace. A lot of people do look when they're creating content, they do they do definitely look to try and make their film as general as possible, which I think is a big mistake. Um, when I say they make the film as general as, as possible, that's not necessarily true. They, they make their marketing strategies for as general as possible, which is understandable. You want to cast that net as wide as possible, but you need to be casting that net as wide as possible to as many particular niche sections of the marketplace as possible. And that's where the, the true power lies in the success of your film. So somewhere in the world is a group of a few million people that your content would feel to them to be akin to tailor-made. So somewhere in the world, there is a nugget of a few million people that absolutely love the kind of work that you're creating, um, the kind of project that you've created, and they will feel like it's been tailor-made for them. They will think that that, that, that is literally hooked into them. Um, understanding what, where those people are and what those people are is the kind of is the core principle of, no, of knowing that human behavior and knowing where your work will sit best. Um, it is part of a filmmaker at this levels, um, a content creator of this levels uh, remit. They need to understand human behavior. I mean, we're artists at the end of the day and artists should, in my opinion, be fascinated by human behavior. And I think that by by using your fascination with human behavior and twisting it in that way, you get to become a better marketeer. There's so many times we've he heard filmmakers be like, I'm not the marketing person. I'm not the person that does the marketing. I don't do the marketing. Well, OK, that's fine. But unless you're prepared to pay thousands upon thousands of dollars per month on a marketing team, you're going to have to do the marketing. So have a different way of looking at marketing. Look at marketing as understanding human behavior and drawing drawing audiences towards your work, baiting audiences towards the themes and the niches that are arriving in the content that you're creating. So let's roll the, the wheel of random, shall we? So we'll do the roll. This is how you roll the wheel of random. You just go left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And that's the wheel of random. And here we go, bang, halt and catch fire. So Halt and Catch Fire is a TV series you may or may not have heard of. Um, it's one of my favourite all-time TV shows. And I literally, I beg you guys to check it out. It's excellent acting. It's excellent stories. It, it covers a niche that I am mega, mega interested in. And it's something that I think has really found its audience over the years. Um, I watched it from the very beginning at, at season one where everyone was talking, well, when, when no one was talking about it. 
Oh, I've got the ski. This the stream is skipping slightly. Okay, there's not a lot I can do about that. I'm afraid. Um, let's see if I can drop down to the thingy a second. Let's see if I can do something with the with the settings on this. I'm getting some information on the stream slipping. Let's see if we can drop down a little bit. Okay. Okay, let's see if that will work. Sorry guys about this, technical difficulties. Um, hopefully we'll get ourselves back. The stream might suddenly run into lower quality, but um, at this present moment in time, because everybody's on their, in, on their phones, on the internet, the Wi-Fi in the air is currently being way more, way more used across, across the radio waves than ever before. We're gonna be having a lot of lag and a lot of downtime. I've just decreased the bit rate, so we should be okay. Um, let me know where we need to go back from or go to and I will try and cover the stuff that we've possibly missed. Let's have a little look. Oops, that's the wrong person. There we go, click that. Okay, so Lauren, you've just mentioned in the comments there, Lauren Tiffany saying that it's, um, that, the, that the stream seems to have skipped. Was there anything, Lauren, that I missed, that I missed out there at all? Were there any points that I missed? Just let me know in the comments and I can go back on that. That would be great. Not comments, let me know in the chat and I'll go back on that. Um, so this show is called Halt and Catch Fire. It's a TV show by AM, uh, which was by AMC, which is a channel in America, and it was, it's now on Netflix in the US, I think, and it's definitely on Amazon Prime in the UK. Um, it's a fantastic show. I can't, I cannot, cannot recommend it enough. Um, these guys go out, set out to create a computer. Um, in the early 1980s, and the spirit of innovation in personal computing is about to catch fire, hot on the trail is a renegade trio, a visionary, an engineer, and a, and a prodigy who risk everything to realize their vision of building a computer that can change the future. Rotten Tomatoes gave it 90% and it ran for four seasons. Um, the niche is retro computing, the history of technology, and fans are gritty drama. So going really niche at the beginning, retro computing, and then to the history of technology, and then fans are gritty, of, of, of gritty drama. So it kind of, it starts on a very tight niche, but there are millions of people who are really, 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 really interested in retro computing. And there are millions of people that are interested in, in the history of technology. And there are tens of millions of people that are interested in gritty drama. So it covers all bases, but having a look at this lead cast, this is the lead cast right here. Um, I didn't name them on purpose because I didn't want you guys to recognize any of the names. I just wanted to see if you could recognize any of the faces. I recognize her. I don't recognize her. I don't recognize him and I slightly recognize him. So it's not a leading cast. It's a cast of, I mean, this is four seasons old. So if you skip back to the very beginning of when this first came out, which I think was in 2013, 2014, something like that, these actors were relatively unknown. Um, and you can see here, one of the, one of the Google, one of the Google um, reviews saying, I knew nothing about this, watched it on a whim. I ended up plowing through all four seasons in about two weeks. It's one of the best shows I've, I've ever seen. The character-driven drama, acting, character development and growth and attention to detail for the period are top. So it's important to understand where this found its audience. Halt and Catch Fire found its audience and it continues to grow. Even though the, even though the, the, the TV show has ended, it's ended at, at season four, um, quite dramatically as well. But it's it's been out four seasons. It's on Netflix. It's on Prime. And it's building momentum because more and more people are consuming it. But it got its it got its audience bang on right because the themes are so important. Yes, there are aspects of dramatization in there. Of course, there are just like the social network. There are certain aspects which you watch it and you're like, that's not true. That's not true. But who cares? It's 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 designed to give a flavor and a and a, um, a fictional depiction of something that actually happened. And you can you can watch it with with several different niche hats on. You can watch it wearing your retro computing hat, looking for all the wonderful moments where they say, oh my God, it's the first ever Apple Macintosh. There it is. And there's some guy working on it and it's like incredible. Oh my God, they're talking about the Commodore Amiga. Oh my God, they're talking about Atari. Oh my God, they're doing this. Oh my God, they're doing that. Like it's it's a retro computing geek out, geekathon. But then there's amazing drama in it. There's tons of, of, of people getting sued. There's lots of things happening. It's a really great, great series. Um, highly recommend it. So we'll spin we'll spin the wheel of random again and see what we get up. 
So let me get bring myself back onto the page. Uh, Uncorked, just released on Netflix. Uncorked. So a young man upsets his father when he pursues his dream of becoming a master sommelier instead of joining the family barbecue business. This film's great. Watched it last night. Really, really good. Um, splits the, splits opinion, definitely. Um, it's got a Google user rating of 91%. Rotten Tomatoes gave it 90%. IMDb gave it 6.4 out of 10. The niche audience here is very, 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 very clear to see, pretty much. People of African-American descent. So Af people of African ascent, uh, uh, descent, although it's filmed in America, but it's people of African descent primarily. But wine lovers, number one. Wine lovers. It's about wine. It's about wine. It's about culture. It's about people of African descent. And ultimately, it's about families. So it, 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 it goes specific niche, bigger niche, super big niche. And that's something that I think is really important. And there's no stars in this. There's no one in here that I've seen loads. I mean, I've, I recognize a few faces, but I'm not but I'm not like Oh, my God, it's that person. Oh, my God, it's this person. They're a star. They're a star. No, it's not that at all. And this was purchased by Netflix. Um, most of the films that, that Netflix say are original content from them are usually produced by outside production companies. Then Netflix comes in, pays a fee to take the film, and then it, and then it, it becomes produced by Netflix. Um, this was released very recently, March the 27th. Um, I highly recommend it. Really, really good. Really great film. A great insight into into wine into wine a great insight into a father-son relationship and and it's very it's very um what can i say it's very uh i guess i guess the word is like what's the word to describe it but it's very it's very much like a um a fly on the wall a fly on the wall depiction of a culture that not many people of my background get to witness every day so it's cool to see that that we're all the same. It's cool to see that some things are different, but yet ultimately we're all the same. It's kind of, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film. And I think it's, I think more films like this should be made. Um, obviously there, 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 there was a big push for it with the Oscars a few years ago, talking about people of African descent making more movies. Um, I think it's very important and it's, it's cool. It's a great subject, uh, subject matter, and it covers lots of different things. I really thoroughly enjoy it. And I, I beg all of you to check it out. So that's uncorked. And then next is, this one is really niche. This is beyond niche. If you guys haven't heard of this, I don't blame you because it's super niche. Critical Role is an American web series in which a group of professional voice actors play Dungeons and Dragons. The show started streaming in March 2015, partway through the cast's first campaign. So this is nuts, right? This is absolutely nuts. IMDb have given it 9.4 out of 10. Critical Role is a web series, okay? Insane success. They play Dungeons and Dragons, the game Dungeons and Dragons with the paper. You've probably seen it in Stranger Things. Um, I've seen it playing off the back of Stranger Things. If you've seen Stranger Things, they play Dungeons and Dragons and Stranger Things, also known as D&D. I'm a player of D&D, love D&D. Um, these guys play Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons is a story generating game where every player has an opportunity to say something and it's all led by a kind of director who is who is known as the dungeon master and the dungeon master sits behind a screen because he or she has a list of things that they have to attach to dice rolling random events occur it's all based on the dice roll and then the characters have to have to react to it and these characters here are all these are the actors dressed up as their characters they don't dress up as their characters during the web series they're just sat behind desks talking about it um, it's pretty, pretty crazy that, that, that everybody inside this, this kind of like world and like sort of realm that they exist in is a professional voice actor. Um, they're coming at it from a dramatic, professionally trained perspective. So you get very high drama, very, very awesome, um, uh, fantasy elements and things. It's, it's a really interesting web series, but very successful. So the niche audience, here we go, D&D, boom, Wizards of the Coast. So Wizards of the Coast are the people that own Dungeons and Dragons. They also own um, Magic the Gathering, um, Netrunner, a whole, boast, a whole bunch of other, of other um, types of like games and tabletop games, like board games. And they, they have hundreds of thousands of people connected to that. Um, the geek subgenre, and then playing off the back of Stranger Things, the Comic-Con explosion, superhero movies, etc. Okay, so this is... 
This is them. Now take a look at this. So Critical Role, The Legend of Vox Makana animated special was something they put on Kickstarter back, um, when was it? Back in, uh, they have last updated it previously, but this was like last year, I think they put this on. Um, this is what Critical Role did. They just put it on Kickstarter, sent it out to their fans in the hope that they could get their second season. This is their second season for their web series, funded. Now, see if you can see how many backers there were and how much money they actually made. That's right. They made 11 million $385,449 to help bring their project to life. It was a 30-day campaign. 88,887 backers. They have millions of subscribers on their YouTube channel and they managed to get 88,887 backers to give them $11.3 million. Niche audiences are the key. 88,000 people. That's not a lot of people. And they made $11.3 million. This is, if this isn't the most like, um, clear example of, 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 where, of where niche is important, it's this. Boom, look at that, $11.3 million. So it's very, very important to bear this in mind with your content. What are the niches in your content? And how can you use that from the very beginning, from conception all the way through to completion and then beyond? So streaming, um, getting it into cinemas, et cetera, et cetera. So challenge, here we go. Find the niche. This is a challenge set for you guys. Staff that are currently watching this, don't talk, because we talk about this all the time, so no chatting in the chat room about this, but the challenge is set for people to find the niche of this particular production company. Okay, they're an American production company headquartered in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. Their name is Rooster Teeth. They have a particular niche. Um, could be connected to crit critical role, might not be connected to critical role, could be somewhere along the lines, but I'll give you guys that challenge. So find out what the Rooster Teeth production company's niche is and see what they're all about. See if you can mention it in the comments section, uh, comment section, comments and the chat room. Yes. So we get thousands of films submitted to us each and every year and it's very rare that we get content that is simply too general, yes. Somewhere in the world is a group of a few million people that your content would feel to them to be akin to being tailor-made for them. So this is the same point re repeated again. So don't worry about being, about being too general. Inside your work, there will be a niche and millions of people will think that it's tailor-made for them. So what is your film idea? Okay, what is it? What is your film idea? The themes, the people, the setting, time and the place. So themes, what are the themes? Who are the people involved? What's the setting? What's the time? What's the place? Dig deep into your into your story. Dig deep into what it is that you're trying to trying to tell and see what the themes are. Then who the people are and then the setting and then the time of that setting and then the place of that setting. So really try and get into there. And then how does this link to people? Who are these people? OK, so it's really important to really think about these these individuals. Create as close of a rep representative model human as you possibly can. So this is done in marketing all the time. Um, in the marketing offices across across London, you'll walk into an advertising agency and you'll see a cardboard cutout of a guy or a girl just stood there being like, hey, like this guy. So this is Tony. He's 48 years old. He likes eggs in the morning for breakfast. His favorite TV show is CSI Miami. He reads Dick Francis books and his favorite pastime is driving his 1987 Jaguar XJS 3 litre around the cobbled streets of the Plymouth Barbican every Sunday with his 16 year old daughter, Francis, where they eat fish and chips and look out to the sea. He enjoys repairing old computers. He buys at car boot sales and selling them on eBay. He prefers cider to beer and goat's cheese to cheddar. He shops in Marks and Spencers for practically everything he needs. He is a widow of four years. This guy doesn't exist. He's an AI generated face. <clears throat> you can do this. There are several websites where you can do it. Um, he is he is a really, 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 really good example of, of um, a person, right? 48 years old. He likes eggs in the morning. His favorite TV show is CSI Miami. He reads Dick Francis books. His daughter's called Francis as, as well interestingly enough. Um, and he lives in he lives in Plymouth, which I, which is Plymouth in the UK, Devon, my hometown. And uh, he eats fish and chips and looks out to the sea with his daughter. He enjoys repairing old computers. He buys at car boot sales, also known as garage sales, the kind of equivalent of a garage sale. We we drive our cars into fields in the UK and open up 
open up the uh, the trunk and have a sale at the back of a trunk. It's called a car boot sale. And we sell, and he sells them on eBay. And he prefers cider to beer. So cider is an alcoholic drink in the UK, which I'm sure people know about in America. I'm pretty sure Americans have cider as well. Maybe I'm being ignorant. I don't know. And he prefers goat's cheese to cheddar cheese. And he shops in Marks and Spencer, which is a shop in the UK, for practically everything he needs. He's a widow of four years. He's not a widow of four years. This guy doesn't exist. But this is the breakdown of a particular person that we would want every single person that makes content to do in their head. Either do in their head, do on a notepaper, do however you want to do it. It's probably best that you actually visualize and create something like this for the particular people that you're trying to reach, because then you can start the process of really going out there and finding them. OK, so look at the models of Hollywood for a clear strategy and see how close you can get to it. The earliest you start, the better. So, OK, you may already have a film at a festival. You may already have a film at one of our festivals. You might already have a film in post-production. You might already have a film in pre-production. You might just be concepting a film idea. All of those positions are, are, are fine, but it's very good to start as early as possible when you start thinking about audiences because you start you need to start capturing their 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 interest via something like a contact form. So this is a contact form that you would have on a page. First, before anything else, right now, you build a contact page. So you take people to the contact page and they, they find out about your film, they find out about the idea of what you're trying to do, and they fill in their details. It's as simple as that. How do you get those contacts? Well, you start with your friends and your family, first of all, and then you ask them to share that information. You branch out as much as you possibly can. And then you go on to things like social media and you start to approach associations. You start to approach websites, places where people exist that match the themes. So if we flick back to this chap, Tony, so um, say, for example, we're making a film about um, 1987, 1987, uh, sort of mid-range sports cars that could be family owned. Um, say we're doing that or we're, we're setting a film in 1987 uh, in Plymouth, for example, or something along those lines. And we can find we can find a 98 uh, Jaguar XJS three litre group where people own those cars. Maybe we'll be able to get a car donated to us for our actual film prior to that. Um, maybe there are people that are really interested in Plymouth. Maybe there are, people, there are people out there that love fish and chips. Maybe there are people out there that love repairing old computers. Whatever our film is about, we send out, we send out the feelers to everyone. And we do it organically, first of all. We don't start paying for audience just yet. We try to get as much, as many email addresses, names, email addresses, and a little bit of information about each person. We try to get that organically. That means not paying for it. So we will have to go to certain associations. We would have to go to certain places of interest, wherever we can go, where there will be people that will be interested in the niche, the niche themes in your work. OK, so we start it in a series of rounds, two, two, maybe three rounds. The first round is obviously the announcement. You say that the that the, the film is happening. You say that you're going to be creating it and you start the process of getting, this is where you kind of get your friends and family and extended friends and family to, to go to your website and fill in the contact details to give you their email address. Um, then you start with the concept presentation. So you start concepting you start concepting ideas. You may you may getting somebody that's that's a very good drawer, a very good a very good um, photographer, and you can start presenting concept ideas. Um, you can also use previously made content to use that internally, not 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 to the wider masses, but you can use that to kind of um, get financiers involved and stuff like that. How to find a producer? One of our videos um, talks about that. Um, we've got that on our YouTube channel. You should check that out. And um, that talks about more kind of ideas about about how to kind of um, present internally to people that would be potential investors and stuff um, where you can use content from outside of your actual work. Um, but, yeah, the more the more original concept stuff that you can create at this stage, the better. Um, you want to then start press releases. Press releases are free to do. They're absolutely free. You just you just basically write the article for the journalist and send it to as many magazines as you possibly can. Um, trade magazines, especially if it counts on certain themes. So Jaguar Owners Club magazine, you send them a press release saying that you're making a film that features a character that drives a Jaguar XJS and he's a really cool, he's a really cool detective or whatever it is, whatever it is that you're doing, it's really important to send out press releases to the particular themed based 
trade magazines, etc. That kind of stuff um, across to Facebook pages that focus on certain aspects, um, Twitter accounts that are, that are stakeholders that that are like um, industry leaders or people that are that that sit inside those theme niches that will that only have say a couple thousand, a few thousand followers. They'll be interested in your project and they will they will they will retweet it. They will do stuff like that because they want to be seen as being current. So it's important to jump on that bandwagon and get those people to share your website link to get as many of these email addresses as you possibly can. As many of these people landing on your contacts page and filling in their information. Um, it also helps with the project funding. So when you go to project funding stage at this point, you should have around about a thousand email addresses up until this point here, possibly more than a thousand. It's really easy to get a thousand email addresses, really, really easy, organically as well, without having to spend any money. And we've seen this so many times, time and time again. I've done it for my own projects. We've seen it done for other projects. It works. So if you do organic, organic pressing out with press releases, concept presentations to people, family and friends, extended friends and family, etc., etc., building your social media not paying a penny, just organically pressing out there. You can then go to project funding. Um, what I would recommend in between press releasing and project funding is the occasional social post that you would then, like a social advertisement that you would then send out to places like Instagram, Twitter and Facebook to get more people. You only need to spend a maximum of, of $100 on this. You don't need to spend that much. And then you can just see which works, what doesn't work. Do it month by month. Really let this let this period of, 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 of getting email addresses, let that be as long as a year, even six months from, from getting the announcement to the concept presentation. During that period, you're perfecting your script, you're getting you're getting your drafts out, you're getting people to give you give you feedback, you're you're doing all sorts of different things production side, pre-product pre pre pre-production side, but you're building you're building an idea of, of where of where this information needs to kind of kind of go so you're so you're sending everybody to the contacts page and then you're getting that you're getting ready for your project funding stage so then you would go on to kickstarter with all of those email addresses you would pump those email addresses into kickstarter as a custom list kickstarter then sends it out or indiegogo actually is the preferred platform for for um, indie filmmakers because with indiegogo if you don't achieve the 100 percent funding you still get the money so if you get 80 percent, you get the money if on kickstarter if it's 100 percent, that's it you can only get 100%. If you don't achieve your funding goal, which you can't change mid mid period, if you don't get it, you don't get it. But Indiegogo, if you get 60, you get 60. If you get 80, you get 80, plus their fees. And their fees are a little bit more the lower down the scale you go, the lower down the scale you hit. Um, but worth worth pointing out, because Indiegogo is definitely the better place for for um, for the filmmaker if, you're, if you don't think necessarily you're going to hit your target. So... When you launch your pro pro project funding, you would create a separate list that would then go out to all of your email addresses and people could give you either a dollar, they could give you either $15, they could give you $20, $40, whatever it is, and you would set up your, your plan for funding that way. If you have email addresses, if you have over a thousand email addresses, you would be foolish to not crowdfund. Um, even if you've got money, even if you've already got money for your, for your production, it's important to crowdfund because what you're doing with crowdfunding you have to look at it from the perspective of the person that's giving you the money. Yes, you're getting money off of people and that's great because that will go towards your project and it will help your project be better. But from their perspective, they're investing in your project. They now have an emotional investment. That financial investment will become an emotional investment to your project. They're hooked. They are hooked in. So getting, getting audience at that at that level through project funding is really important because they have vested interest and a lot of people don't think this but it's so true if you give $25 to a film and that film gets made and gets released you're going to want to watch it of course you are you're going to want to watch it and you it's okay if that if your $25 went towards the catering and and you then had to pay $5 to watch it on Amazon Prime that's fine of course it's fine you've got to support indie filmmakers especially at this level um so it's really important to make these points because because the project funding aspect you have to switch the perspective on the audience so many filmmakers say to us i don't like going on to kickstarter or going on indiegogo and crowdfunding i always feel like i'm begging and borrowing from people you are if you're only approaching your friends and your family 
and you're begging them and you know that they're not interested. But if you're if you've already got a niche set up of people on an email list that are interested, genuinely interested in the work that you're about to create, you're not begging or borrowing or stealing off them. You're presenting the project to them and they're helping you make it happen. It's a wonderful exchange. You have to make sure that you switch that perspective and look at it that way. I'm saying this with with great with great enthusiasm because we always hear from filmmakers that they feel weird about asking for money. Well, if you feel, feel weird about asking for money, you're, you're not gonna succeed as a filmmaker at this level because you're gonna always have to ask for money because that's the only way your films are gonna get made unless you're wealthy. Um, that's the bottom line. So get into the idea of the perspective of people that fund you and understand that they are hooked audience. So after that, after you've got the funding, you then start the whole sort of sneak peeky sort of aspect of things. So a sneak peek from pre-production, you send that out. You pump that out. You hope that other people will share it. The people that are now funded your film, by the way, are now awesome for sharing your information to new pros prospective audience members that would then go to your contacts page. Once you've got those people in the, in the funding aspect, once they're locked in, they will share everything from this point onwards. They will share it because they'll be on your Instagram, they'll be on your Facebook, they'll be on your Twitter. And as soon as you pump something out, a nice picture from pre-production or something that's really interesting about what you're currently working on, getting the project ready, ask them to share that information. Try and get as many, as many email addresses from prospective people as possible. I know loads of people that are interested in the things that I'm interested in. I share WhatsApp WhatsApp links all the time to my friends that I know have the same interests as me, some things that they may not have seen, some like a video game that's come out recently or something like that, or a trailer that's been released for a particular film. I'll share it with my friends because I know they're going to be into it. And that's how that's how it works. So always remember that you need to be and it, it needs to be done carefully. You can't just keep sharing a, an image every day. That doesn't that's not how you build hype. You build sneak peeks over, over small nugget periods of time. You can either do it in, in time in time stamps, so you can do like one every month or one every two weeks, or you could do it over milestone stamps. You could do it over every 50 email addresses or every 500 email addresses, however your, 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 your contact data collection is going. So after every, say, 250 email addresses, you release a, you release a video. Or after every 500 email, um, email addresses, you release, sorry, after every 250, you release a picture. After every, after every 500, you release a video. Something along those lines. That'll help you mo to monitor your, your input as well. And you'll be able to see, oh, that group of people have done really well. I've got loads and loads and loads of email addresses from that group of people. I'll create a trailer specifically for them. Oh, this one's doing pretty well as well. I'll create a trailer straight for them. So it's really important to have for 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 those two sections to have everyone being everyone being like utilized in those particular areas. And you're knowing that the audience are coming to you for those particular for the for, for that for that particular niche. So you know that in the film, when you st start to shoot the film, you know to give that certain weight and that certain weight. The elements of themes need to be weighted throughout your production to to um, justify the interest of your audience to make them think, oh, yeah, great. I mean, a really obvious one is is fan service um, that's shown in the new Star Wars films. Um, what, like them or like them or hate them, love them or detest them. Um, they. They have certain aspects of fan service in them that all of a sudden you'll see a spaceship from the past and you're like, wow, that's the spaceship from movie number one or movie number two. Oh my God, oh, nostalgia. And that can happen. And that's, that's something that you kind of, if you know your niche audience, you can deliver that fan service a little bit. And that's perfectly fine at this level, in my opinion. I think it works perfectly. Um, you want to be playing to the people that have given you money for your film. You want to be playing to the people that believed in you at the very beginning of your of your at your announcement stage and when you were concepting your your presentation. Like all of that stuff, you want to give them what they want. Of course you do. And that's the key to longevity as an artist. Um, so yep. Yeah, so the next step would be build up hype for first trailer release the first trailer. So you build up the hype for the first trailer. You tell everyone the trailer's coming soon. Trailer will be released on the 31st of whatever. Trailing will be released on the on the 31st of whenever, whenever, whenever. And you get people to 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 um to be to be told when the trailer lands or be told told when the trailer hits. Get yourself to our to our website. Get on our mailing list 
and we will send we will send stuff to you. Okay, really, really important. Um, Chico Photo is saying is say, Chico Photo is saying creating a mailing list is an action I'll take now. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Chica. <laughs> I'm glad that it, this is this is drawing you guys home. This is good. It's so important because this is where your audience is. It's where they will be, and you'll have you'll have the list, and you'll be like, these are my people. Um, so yeah, release trailer one. Build up hype for trailer two. So trailer one should be like a a kind of a moving, rotating sneak peek. So you'll have a sneak peek from pre-production, obviously, which will be photographs, whatever it is, maybe concept drawings, anything like that. Um, then you'll have then you'll have a uh, release trailer, which you can then do um, as a kind of snippet, say like maybe 20 seconds, 25 seconds, something like that. And then trailer two will be, and this is the actual story beyond the visuals. Um, and that's again, it's it's a it's the same process that Hollywood movies go through because Hollywood movies have recognized that that process absolutely works. So there's no reason why you can't do the same process just because you're going to get 10,000 email addresses and Universal are, are going to get 11.6 million email addresses. It doesn't matter. 10,000 email addresses. If you if you messaged Liftoff and said, hey, Liftoff, I really want to be in London Liftoff. Here's my here's my. Um, nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 short. By the way, here's 10,000 email addresses of people based in London that really want to see it. It'd be really difficult for us to say no to that. We need to sell tickets. Um, and if it's a good film, of course, we'll take it, double whammy. So it's really important to make sure that we have all of this set up. And it's really important to know that that we go through this, this, strategic, this strategic route from announcement, concept presentation, press releases, project funding. Press releases can be done all the way through this process. So as you're releasing trailer one, press release. As you're releasing trailer two, press release all the time. It's really easy to do press releases. It's a myth. People think that it's weird to do that sort of stuff. It's not it's easy. Just look up online. It will tell you how. There's tons of videos on YouTube. Maybe we'll do a workshop about it in future because we've done loads of press releases for Liftoff and they seem to be working or in, all internally as well. So it's, it's good. It's good to know this stuff. We want to share that information with you. So round two, yes, here we go. Study audience data, looking at the numbers and locale. Select festivals where the most amount of audience population reside. This is key. This is absolutely key. So in the round two section, look at your audience data, look at the numbers and where they're positioned. So if you say, okay, we've got, we've got um, 500 people in North America, 250 of them are, new, are in New York. Oh, wow, 200 of them are in, are in Austin, Texas, and 50 of them are in Chicago. Okay, so are you going to start submitting to festivals in Florida? Why would you? Why would you submit to a festival in Florida? You've got guaranteed audience in New York, Austin and Chicago. So just submit to those those three cities. Just submit to festivals in those three cities and tell the festivals that you've got audience in those cities and then get some people to go to it. Selling 10 tickets to people that aren't on, on, on our mailing list, on Liftoff's mailing list, sell, selling 10 tickets to those people is like selling... 500 tickets for us because we're introducing people to to indie film to important true independent cinema so 10 people that you bring that have never been to a film festival before because they're more connected to niche and the themes that are inside your work them coming to a film festival for the very first time is worth its weight in gold it's a wonderful thing and you are not only you are not only supporting your work you're supporting the festival's work and you're supporting the culture on the whole and your industry at this level on the whole. Really important. And hats off to people that do this. We love it when that happens. We're so chuffed when people come to us for the very first time and they're like, I've never been to a film festival before. This is fun. It's a great, great thing. Um, so yeah, the, the CSV is the comma separated value file that gets created on all contact lists. It's just a spreadsheet with, with email addresses that fall all the way down and all those email addresses will say, where they where where the email is and where they are so that it's important to capture the information about where they're from um where they're based etc etc very important to know where your audience actually live um so yeah submit to those festivals informing the festival of your film's audience potential within that festival city write email phone repeat yep write to us handwritten letter or typed out letter printed everyone responds to the post snail mail gets an immediate response oh i've got a letter how many people get letters these days? Very important to send letters. Email, okay, fine, that makes sense. Phone, not many people are ballsy enough to pick up the phone. We have a phone number, phone us, we'd love to chat to you. Repeat, keep doing it. Just keep 
Just keep doing it to the festivals that you want to get into. Write to them, email them, tell them what you've got. Tell them that they're, we get thousands of films a day, a, a day, I wish. We get thousands of films a month sent into us. And when, when we get phone calls and emails from people that are interested in us, that are interested in screening with us because they have audience connected, then we want to have those conversations. Um, if you're just emailing us to, or, or phoning us just to check that we've got your submission, check Film Freeway for that. We don't need to have those conversations because we'll have thousands of those and we'll be inundated with telephone calls and conversations. And we're only a five man team. We're not massive. So remember that. But if you do have a list of, of, of people that want to come and see your work in a respective liftoff city, contact us. Contact us any way how. And we will we will definitely take that call. Um, yeah, so to submit to well-attended festivals, that's us, and festivals with good online presence, oh, that's us, um, and get a few laurels for your poster. So it's good at this stage. The, the festival stage is great because you can get the laurels for your poster, and this will automatically help. You're not going to get, if you get 10,000 email addresses, which I think you will definitely get if you follow this platform, follow this process, you should get about 10,000 email addresses, roughly, thereabouts, if you've got good, strong niches and you've identified your core demographic. Um, <clears throat> not all of those 10,000 people are going to go to festival screenings, obviously. So you want to release online at some point or try and get a theatrical distribution. Now you can go through theatrical distribution through the film markets with us. So that will definitely help. The film market distribution with us will be will be really, really um, kind of clear as we as we as we go through the year. COVID-19 is causing a few problems at the moment, but we'll get through it. I'm positive of that. And once we get through that, we'll be able to go to film markets like Cannes, uh, AFM again, and, and EFM, the European film market. We take concepts, we take all sorts of stuff, and that's part of being a professional member, which we'll get onto later. But at the festival stage, getting the laurels on the poster is really key. It looks good. People, people are automatically drawn to that type of art house cinema that has a few laurels on there, not going to lie. It, it's, it's true. You'll see that and you'll be like, oh, okay. It won London Liftoff. It got a season award. It's, it won the Palm d'Or. Okay, great. I'll check that film out. I'll check that web series out. Whatever. You can get laurels on all sorts of content. So make sure you get a few laurels on your poster and then you go through the next bit after that. So it's important to then, to then have a period where your festival season has concluded for your work and then you look to try and sell it to either get the best possible return you can. So theatrical distribution... Um, you look to get it onto a streaming platform, whatever you can. At this stage, if you've got 10,000 email addresses, you are winning because you can approach sales agents and say, here's my film, here's my data. Oh, don't look at it. That's my data. These are people that want to watch the film and they're based all around the world. Let's get a meeting with Netflix. And the sales agent will be like, yes, because you've come to them with 10,000 email addresses. That's excellent. Netflix have the power to turn that 10,000 email address into 10 million, 15 million. It's easy because you've, all, you've proved that an audience exists. There's your proof. That's your proof. Don't give them the email addresses until you get a deal, but there they all are. And you always keep your data, it's yours. So you can continue to make more films and build that 10,000, keep making more films, expand on niches, Turn up to different aspects of different things. Turn up different different niches within your work and build a brand that covers certain aspects of those niches and themes. And then you'll always have an audience with you. You'll have an audience for life and you'll be able to sell your work. You'll be able to get more financing for your future projects and you'll be able to build your brand, which is super duper key. And you'll get festival acceptance after festival acceptance. That's how this works. So, yeah. Build an understanding of your audience, festival feedback, their habits, what happened at the screenings, etc. And restart the release structure. So restart the release structure after the festival, go through the whole process again. So it's had its festival laurels, it's done that process, and just this would be a slightly smaller release structure, but it will cover the same aspects. So the trailer comes out again, you do different things that way, you rebuild that, you rebuild that hype. A really great example of this is Parasite. Parasite came out a couple years ago. It then won the Palme d'Or. It did its festival run, did really well in Venice. I think it was in Venice as well. It, did, it went to different places and then it's restarted its release structure. It restarted its marketing. It restarted everything. It won the Oscar, obviously. So it, it got through that awards period and then it got re-released into cinemas. So there's no reason why you can't follow that strategy. 
Obviously, you won't necessarily have the same success as Parasite, but you can follow the release strategy. You can follow the structure of that release strategy and you can do well. And you can, again, build more audience, build more people onto your contacts page. And then those people, you can when you start, set up your next your next project, you go to project funding, you've got 12,000, 15,000, 20,000 email addresses to, to email to say that you've started your next project. You get a thousand people giving you money, you've got a thousand people giving you money. So this is where it gets really important for us. And this is a this is a point that we keep trying to make to, to our filmmakers again and again and again. Please become more responsible with your enthusiasm for gaining knowledge to better equip your output as an artist. Okay? Try to be way, way more sensitive to the work that's being created by your peers. Okay, so important. The filmmakers that rise from the dust, and we see this all the time, are those that do as much as they can to better understand their audiences, okay? So understand your audiences, understand the themes that you do in your work, and you will become a better filmmaker, 110%. Attend more film festivals, okay? Pretty difficult right now, but guess what? Manchester Liftoff Online is currently is currently streaming on Vimeo On Demand. Our online festival screen in various categories of projects by people in similar positions to you. So watch the work. Manchester Lift Off Film Festival Online 2020, running till Sunday night, April the 5th, 10 p.m. This Sunday, April 5th, that's when it finishes. Links in the description below, exclusively on Vimeo On Demand. So the links aren't in the description just yet, I don't think, I need to pop them in there. But if you go to Vimeo On Demand and you search for Manchester Lift Off Film Festival Online, you will find it. So yeah, create a mission plan, here we go after COVID-19. So here we go. Better equip yourself as an artist. What to do next? How to move forward? Search for the local film festival screenings in your area and attend them. Go to more film festivals. Attend your film festivals. Watch content online. Volunteer some of your time to help others in their projects. So be, be the light in person on someone else's project. Offer your services as, as an editor free of charge. Do as much as you can for your industry and your industry will do loads for you. Engage with filmmakers whose work for you, whose work you find similar to your own. So find filmmakers. You'll find them by going to more film festivals, by watching more film festivals online. And engage with them. Email them. Talk to them. Talk to them about what you've got coming up. Talk to them about what you would like to work on. Maybe you can get something going with them. It will be really cool. You should totally do it. Engage with filmmakers whose work you find on the next run up from yours. So yeah, look at the next run up from you. Look at films that are, that are being... Um, making so much more money than you. They're not making much, much more money. They're getting more money in funding than you are. And engage with those filmmakers, the next run up from you. Engage with them and find out what they're doing differently. So engage with filmmakers whose work you find inspiring. So again, push that boundary. Talk to as many filmmakers and many production companies, producers that are doing work that you absolutely love. Just engage with them. Meet with them for a coffee. Have a Skype chat with them. Whatever you can do to make sure that you're constantly building your contacts list and you're understanding what this industry is doing and where it's going. Discover true indie film content online. Yep. Pay for it and share it. Very important. So watch Manchester Lift Off online. If you're a professional member, you can get to watch it for free. Um, if you're not, then you can become a professional member or you can just watch Manchester Lift Off online and pay for it. It's $6. It supports our position on Vimeo On Demand. It supports our marketing initiative to get as many short films and feature films for later festivals into the eyes and ears of, of, of people out there and helps us to kind of exist and survive during this crazy, crazy time. Um, keep working on those ideas. Yep. Keep working on ideas. Build a stable and reliable creativity engine. And remember, you are not one film. You are not one film. Right now, there may be people watching this that are t thinking about how they can get their film set up to follow these structures, follow these plans, blah, 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 blah. It might not be right. Your film right now might not be right. So remember, you're not one film. Build the next project. Start from the beginning and start again and just keep making films. Just keep working at it. The harder you work, the luckier you become. And send your concepts to lift off and we will take them to the Cannes Film Festival to road test. So Cannes being suspended in time to July. And when we go out there in July, when it's when it's not happening or whenever it's happening after that, we will be meeting tons of people. So we're, we're, we're taking our professional members work to all of the film markets this year and beyond. We'll be meeting with over 50 sales agents, producers and VOD platforms such as Amazon and Netflix. And it's a big part of our membership entitles you to use this market service every year free of charge. Um, Manchester Liftoff, final update today at 4pm. 
be sure to check that out. So we've managed to lift off, set the reminder. I don't know if this actually looks very good as the um, as the image looks a bit skew iffy and a bit um, a bit pixelated on my screen. But it's giving a rundown of the top 10 voted films today. The links are in the description for that. You'll be able to head, head off and see it. And then, uh, yeah, are you looking to launch a film career? So the Production Accelerator. The Production Accelerator is a five week online program. It's currently at set at $497 and it enables you to connect and build audiences, connect with the in international industry, package your projects for the market, creative and professional development, and all of the benefits of professional membership, which we'll get onto in a second. So all of that for 497, it's a five week online program that, that, that Liftoff co-founder Ben Pullman, the other Liftoff co-founder to me, has actually created. It's exceptional. It will really help you get your feature film. If you're creating a feature film content, get that off the ground. All web series content, episodic content would work. Get that off the ground and actually get it into the marketplace and get it distributed. A really, really, really great course and something that that really draws on the the um, the 10 to 11, well, 11 years of experience that that myself and Ben have had. Of, of curating film festivals and seeing projects from conception to completion and seeing them actually do well at markets and sometimes f fall down at markets. So this really brings all of that knowledge together in one in one five week online program. I highly recommend it, couldn't recommend it enough. And it's slashed right now until Sunday 6 p.m. It's currently $297 instead of $497. So a saving of $200, five week online program. If you've got nothing to do at the moment, go check it out. Or you can sign up to watch our free introductory courses via our website. So there are free introductory courses via our website. There's also a live stream every Friday from, from, our, from our base here in James's home office. Um, every Friday we'll be doing different workshops. The new workshop will be, going, will be going up for you guys to set reminders in the next few hours. And professional membership. This is where we talk about our, our standard professional membership here on the Liftoff Global Network. So you get free submissions. You get career road mapping sessions. You get to join us in this audience. You get to join us in the audience at Pinewood when we eventually come out of social isolating. Uh, you get a, a regular jobs dashboard where jobs are added to the, 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 uh, the network platform all the time. It's a live jobs dashboard where you can apply for jobs, all specifically tailored for people that are at this level of the film industry. And film market representation at all of the major film markets, which we touched on earlier on. So that professional membership is $189, and that's for the whole year. It's a renewal It's a renewal thing, but you get free submissions. The idea is that if you're a professional member, you're on the trajectory to becoming a fully-fledged professional filmmaker, and you'll always get free submissions with us. You'll always get career advice with us. You'll always get opportunities in, in the jobs industry, or in the industry of, of in regards to jobs. You can always come and meet us, and we'll always take your work to the film markets. We will be your representative at film markets, which is something that's highly, highly valuable because it's so expensive to go to these things. And with Liftoff membership, $189, that enables us to go. But it's going to it will cost you about four grand to go to Cannes. So we'll go to Cannes. If we get any deals, we don't take a single fee. All we ask for is the $189 per year, and that gets you all of these things and a hell of a lot more. And we're constantly adding new features to this platform. So where to sign up? So it's Liftoff dot network forward slash membership the description does have this link um, so go there check it out if you're not a professional member already the production accelerator like i say is 200 dollars off and that's it finn so i was just wondering if we have any any questions so we've got a question here from chica photo thank you chica photo for asking the question so are there any film industry websites or youtube channels that focus on film marketing specifically I wonder how less commercial films like Amelie, Want, Wants, 500 Days of Summer succeeded marketing wise. Um, yeah, 500 Days of Summer, I believe, got their got their um, marketing work from a backhander through Fox, I think. Don't don't, don't quote me if I'm I, I may or may not be right on that, but uh, double check it. But um, there's all a lot. There's all a lot of of um, of of, uh, of information out there. Definitely a really good one for for the sort of marketing data collecting is Stephen Follows. Um, Stephen spelt with a PH and Follows. It's a very good website. I'll stick, I'll stick that in the, in the description below of where you can find out that. He does a series of blogs, um, very, very prolific blog writer, and he does data collection of the marketing that he understands about different things. So um, one particularly great one on, on, uh, on distribution that he's done, which is great. Um, so yeah, definitely check it out and I'll stick it in the description below and, and yeah, carry on with the conversation in the comments. We'll be here 24 seven, um, 
360 something days a year and we'll be there in the comments section so we'll be happy to kind of continue the conversation in the comments but um thank you very much and if there's no more questions auf wiedersehen